AIDS brings a response Fight from the government. AIDS, the which claims life. Welcome to Extra Tea with your camp host, William Hampson. And my fabulous car host, Gloria. In between us, we'll be looking back through the decades at how Britain reported on the AIDS pandemic. And where we will try to unpick individual stories in the newspaper archives from the 80s, 90s, and noughties. Ready. Ready. All right, let's do it. Welcome to this special episode of This Is Your Hivstory. And today I'm in the very quaint looking slough, which I'm told is pronounced slog here in Berkshire. And I'm at the home of Thames Valley Positive Support, the headquarters and home to the HIV podcast. TVPS is an established HIV charity that has been supporting people with HIV AIDS for 39 years. Now, Sarah and Jess are about to start recording their next episode of the HIV podcast, and I'm about to interrupt them, aided and abetted by the team here at TVPS HQ. So let's sneak in and surprise them. So we're just outside the room now, and the girls are just about to start recording the HIV podcast, and they've got no idea that I'm here. Chantel, Zoe and Sue have um, snuck me in so once they get started we're going to go and surprise them so oh it sounds like they're going now so let's go and surprise them come on guys each week we focus on a person historical event come on pop let's go what's going on who's this Sarah Jess <laughs> sorry to interrupt your recording but the next episode of the HIV podcast will just have to wait as Thames Valley Positive Support and the HIV podcast this is your history. Right. You were like this, if that's any help. <laughs> Hopefully you're sitting comfortably, right? Are you ready? So here we go. So over 120 episodes of the HIV podcast, listened to in 176 countries, nominated for various industry podcast awards, currently the Areolas in the Impact Award category, a whole team of people behind the scenes, several dogs, various roaming pusses, the neighbour down the road, the postman and a menagerie of wild animals and at the heart of it all, two fabulous hosts Sarah McAdam and Jessica Harding and a whole team of very important people behind the scenes. All with one goal, to change attitudes and bring an end to HIV stigma, one podcast at a time. Oh, deep breath. And when you're both not behind the microphone educating the globe on all matters of HIV, you both, of course, have day jobs. Sarah, the CEO, and Jess, the deputy CEO of TVPS, Thames Valley Positive Support. And between you both, you have over 40 years of experience in the HIV sector. And, of course, a dedicated team of support managers, trustees, volunteers and service users of of whom we will come on to a little bit later. But first, let's take a look at where it all began. Hot off the press on the 23rd of August 1985, the Reading Evening Post printed a story with the headline, Reading AIDS Risk Warning, and the article reads, A vital helpline for sufferers of the killer disease AIDS has been set up in Reading. A project follows the thinking that it is only a matter of time before the town gets its first AIDS case. Volunteers will man a speaking telephone inquiry line for two hours every week to dispense help, advice and information about the disease. The article goes on to state that Reading Area Aid Support Group is managing the helpline and in these early years, its press officer Jim Hoggart is frequently quoted putting the record straight on HIV and AIDS. What more can you tell us about the early days of the helpline? Across Berkshire, there were lots of little groups being set up. So I think Reading were definitely more organised because they had a helpline. But at the same time in Slough, a small group called the AIDS Support Group had been set up by gay men who who had HIV, had AIDS, meeting in each other's houses. They used to meet secretly. They tried to meet after dark so they wouldn't draw attention to themselves. In other areas of Berkshire, similar things were happening. It's great that they set up a helpline. I think that's quite progressive, actually, when you look at other areas of the country they were slower to respond. Um, and obviously London led the way because that was kind of the, the mecca for it all going off, wasn't it? Mm. And in the article, the Reading Area Aid Support Group press officer, Jim Hoggart, does state it's just a matter of time before the first person gets AIDS in Reading. At the moment, as far as we know, there are no cases in the town, but we are following a familiar pattern. And before long, there will be a problem. And Jim was right, just like you said, because the very next week on the 30th of August, 1985, in the same paper, the Reading Evening Post, was the following front page headline. 
So it says Reading man dies of AIDS. AIDS has claimed its first victim in Reading. A man from the town has died from the killer disease it's been revealed. District Medical Officer of West Berkshire Health Authority, Dr Peter Dixon, said the man died more than a month ago. Dr Dixon added, we have known about him since the beginning of the year and for some of that time he was in hospital. He received treatment in a hospital run by West Berkshire Health Authority and elsewhere. This has happened. It's probably the first, but it won't be the last. And the media should not make too much fuss about it. They're always goody though, aren't they? Oh, imagine being that poor person. It's like patient zero, isn't it? All over again. But in Berkshire. Yeah. And it's amazing just going on from what Jim was saying and and you were saying yourself is that it's obviously clearly... Um, HIV AIDS has obviously re- reached Reading some time prior before before the man sadly passes away. Jim Hogger from the Reading Area AIDS Support Group is quoted as saying in regards to that article, I agree with the district medical officer and there is no risk to the general public. And the man is not named as the article states, Dr Dixon declined to name the Reading victim or give any further details about his background. And I mean, why should he have to? Why should he have to disclose more? Yeah, imagine if they had named him. It would have become a witch hunt. Yeah. And his poor family having to deal with that. And what, what were we, like, 1985, height of the epidemic, stigma was rife. Misinformation was rife. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah, I mean, the paper's kind of going for it, aren't they? They probably couldn't believe their luck. They've got their first patient who's died of AIDS. It's front page story. And with that story making the front page on Friday, by Monday, the Reading Evening Post concluded in their Post Opinion column, the Post makes no apology for making it headline news. There is a widespread concern over the disease, particularly when one examines its record in the United States, when it has become a major killer. It will be time to worry when a death by AIDS in Britain is not news. It will mean that the urgent research to find ways of preventing and curing AIDS has not found solutions quickly enough. Now, I can't get my head around what she's trying to say in the in this article. So I, I get they're justifying their position that, that, you know, it should be headline news. I don't agree with it, mm. um, but that's the stance they're going to take, isn't it? It's the rest of it. It will be a time to worry when a death by AIDS in Britain isn't news. Yeah, I can't work it. A weird thing up. to say. <laughs> To be honest, the second part makes it sound like a slight apocalypse. You know, she says it will mean that the urgent research to find ways of preventing and curing AIDS has not found solutions quickly enough. That almost sounds like basically it's just wiped the entire world out. Yeah, she's implying that everybody's going to die. Not everybody. I bet just gay men. Gay, All gay men are going to die. And that'll be it. Research wasn't quick enough and now, now we've lost them all. Weird, weird way to write. But what truly caught my eye was a series of written exchanges between newspaper readers the Reading Area Aid Support Group press officer Jim Hogger and journalist Rosalind Renshaw, who at the time had a topical column. An age before dropping your opinions online, here you had to write it, lick it and stick it in a post box and wait to see if it appeared in the newspaper. Now, it's impossible to read them all, but one of the early exchanges I stumbled across was from the Reading Evening Post on the 23rd of September 1985 with the headline, Responsibility for AIDS Plague. And now the um, letter sent in by a reader reads, Dear Rosalind, The media is quite correct in condemning the gay plague AIDS. It is a gay disease, but unfortunately, innocent lives have been lost or ruined as a result of the deprived lifestyle of gay blood donors. Have they no conscience about the tragedy they have caused? They have no cause to condemn the media for alerting the public of the coming aftermath of their perversion. We are becoming a nation with no moral virtues at all, and marriage has ceased to have any meaning except in the legal sense. The permissive society has gone too far, and it is the innocent as yet unborn generation who will inherit the dreadful punishment. I hope the gay brigade (laughs) hang their heads in shame that a nine-year-old boy has had his life ruined by AIDS. And he is only one of many victims. We are a sick society without any doubt. Oh, can I just God. Yeah. Can I just say, because we're both fuming now, aren't we? If you want to find out the name of anybody to do with this show today, it's who wrote that? Who wrote that letter? Hopefully mm. their views have changed. Oh, do you know what I wanted to say, Sarah? You always bang on about how much you love the 80s. I mean, anyone oh. that obviously listens to our podcast, the HV podcast, will know that. Sarah, I hate the 80s. All we ever learn about is awful things. The language in this is horrendous. Like, oh, my God, perversion, gay plague. Like, it's 
horrific. Gear Brigade. Yeah. Like that, though. No, I quite like it. I think we should own that. Do you know what I mean? Because it sounds quite jolly. If you take it out of this awful letter, that sounds quite jolly. It's the Gay Brigade. You know, but I just And I bet the lady who wrote this this is from the Purple Rinse Brigade. Do you think it's a lady? (laughs) Yeah, I am actually. How weird. I read it as a man. So really? I read that as a man, yeah, a hundred percent. But interestingly, in the in the printed article at the bottom, people would usually put their name, and um, I think they would put their street. Um, mm. But here it just says name and dress supplied, so they're giving them obviously some kind of an- anonymity. No, I'm not surprised. Well. But I went okay. with woman. Is that bad? <laughs> oh no, I think it's very interesting. I'm with you, Jess. I thought it was a man. Yeah, that's how I read it. Oh. But I mean, the language that's been used. I mean, it just highlights the stigma, doesn't it? Mm. I don't think, you know, I grew up in the 80s, Jess did. But I suppose... So in... we were kind of growing up when uh, all of this was happening, but I don't, you know, I was too too young to kind of remember it uh, and probably shielded from from the stigma around this anyway. I think it just highlights perfectly what that community were facing. People saying, this is all your fault because of your depraved lifestyle. Absolutely horrific. I mean, I'm incensed. The following week, on 30th of September 1985, in the Reading Evening Post, under the headline AIDS, Gays Are Not To Blame, uh, Reading Area AIDS Support Group Press Officer Jim Hoggart responds. He said, Dear Rosalind, I don't know whether I was more angry or sad when I read the letter from Name and Address Supplied in Monday's Post. It beggars belief that someone can condemn a group for their sexual preference, let alone condemn them to a painful and slow death. AIDS is no respecter of sex, age, lifestyle or sexual orientation. In parts of Central Africa, where the virus which causes AIDS, brackets HTLV3, is widespread, it's found equally in men and women. In Belgium, the number of AIDS cases nearly equals our own, and yet only 10% are gay or bisexual. And it's the same in other countries. AIDS is not a gay plague. It is a public health matter which affects all of us. To pretend it's anything else condemns more people to die and more to suffer. As far as hanging their heads in shame, the gay brigade have been in the forefront of the fight against this disease and campaigning for the resources and help from government and health bodies to eliminate AIDS. Nobody caused AIDS any more than someone caused polio, TB or the common cold. The sooner we realise this and stop pointing the finger, the sooner we can defeat it. Ignorance and fear are the main dangers, not AIDS. Oh, I love well said. Jim Hoggart. Yes, Jim. Oh. Doesn't it just like make you want to like just punch the air with excitement and like just uh, encourage him? And when you watch it, it's a sin and you see like, you know, hashtags that come up saying, be more Jill. You know, oh, I yeah. think the slight typo should be be more Jim. Yes. 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 Oh, we should use that locally. Yeah, that is lovely. (laughs) This is so nice to hear history from our group. I think the thing with the press is where at the time they were just writing this tripe. I think when you look back at it now retrospectively, it does document history in regards to HIV and AIDS and how charities like yourselves, you know, were just having this constant battle and fight. And it wasn't um, just instant social media posts that you could just type and then click send and out there there's a long laborious process of being able to respond to readers or get your point across by having to as i said earlier you know uh, hand write a letter or type it on a on a typewriter or computer and then stick it in the letter box yeah that's true will and i'm not gonna lie i've been fighting with the people on facebook again so i more than anybody today know the utter bile that people post about HIV and just the utter nonsense. Like you said, it is a quick fire thing. Whereas this I love because it takes it takes so much effort. You really have to want to be like, I really need to get my point across and put that effort in. Yes. I know I hear what you're saying. But imagine being the person that wrote that original letter and taking that time out of your day to sit down and oh, write it. They need more hobbies. I know. And then walk to the post office and buy your stamp and then post it. Oh, it's just weird, isn't it? I mean, I'd love to know where Jim is now, but his energy and the way he articulates himself is, I think, fantastic. He conducts himself so professionally. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. so and beside Jim Hoggart's letter is a lengthy letter from a Kenneth Halliwell, who also outlines the points raised by Jim and to which he concludes. The idea that diseases are punishments is nauseating. Are our hospitals really full of sinful people, ill through their need for repentance? 
Should we perhaps regress in our understanding of mental disorder and consider it work of some malevolent demon? Of course not. Such notions are irrational, dangerous, and along with the rest of sophistry and illusion should be committed to the flames. Such concepts as innocence and guilt, permissiveness, punishment and shame used extensively throughout last week's letter can do nothing but contribute to the already considerable degree of human suffering. It is ironical, what a word, that along with the high beliefs in truth, virtue and morality, there is so frequently the utmost contempt, disgust and ignorance of everything human. Oh, there is feeling in these letters, isn't there? Jim's got some support. Good. Because I imagine knowing how society was at the time that he might have found uh, felt quite isolated sometime. He's kind of banging the drum for people living with HIV. But no, someone has come out in support of him. Excellent. Kenneth. Well done, Kenneth. Yes, Kenneth. Be more Kenneth. Yes. And it didn't end there as the following week on the 7th of October, 1985, the reader who initially wrote in responded to Jim and Kenneth's letter under the title AIDS Facts. Dear Rosalind, in your column last week, you published letters from Jim Hogger and Kenneth Halliwell. Both would do well to stick to the facts instead of confusing the issue. AIDS is a new disease caused by promiscuity and introduced into this country by means of blood transfusions from gay donors. This is fact. I mean, just to break away from the article, where is this individual getting their facts? Yeah, it's a good point, isn't it? Because they're wrong. Oh, so I'm still torn whether it's a man or a woman now. But um, <laughs> Anyway, the article does continue. In my own earlier letter, I did not suggest that all diseases are from a heavenly judgment. Women suffering from the disease have contracted it from haemophiliac husbands who had had infected transfusions or from bisexuals. Again, where is this coming from? But the children who have AIDS got it from infected blood transfusions or mothers with the disease. What is wrong with the truth, virtue and morality? Your correspondents scoff at it, but we are supposed to be a civilised society and it's signed off, as we said earlier, name and address supplied. If this person was supplying their name and address, why didn't they add it in? Because they were happy to add Jim's and Kenneth's name. So why Mm. don't we know this person's name? Mm. Maybe they asked for it not to be publicised, which is very telling, isn't it? Because they know... That they are on very <gasps> thin ice. That yep. is like an 80s, like, you know, like a keyboard warrior where yeah. they just go under their screen name and they're just like firing out hideous comments. That is that the old school way of doing mm. it. Mm. An old school troll. Yep. Uh, yeah, exactly. A troll, a very judgmental <laughs> troll talking about promiscuity and morality and bandying all these words around. Oh, God, I really don't. Name and address supplied. I do not like you. No, and I'm laughing in the background, not because it's funny, but just because it's just so ridiculous. Mm. Just, oh. I think you made a good point, Will. Where did they, this person get their information from? What are they basing all of this on? Because there you know, wasn't much information around at the time. That was the problem. But that's what I was going to say. I think we need to, I'm not, I am not sticking up for name and address supplied, everyone, just to make that clear. But what I will say is, and we have to bring ourselves back to this sometimes as well on our podcast, is we have to do this where I'll get so irate and you're like, but you need to remember it's the 80s. So I'm not sticking up for name and address supplied. Absolutely not. But what I am going to say is, you're right, there wasn't much information and an awful lot of it was sort of like hearsay, wasn't it? Or the little bits and bobs. So they're probably taking all this hearsay, all this chit-chat in the neighbourhood and going, well, that's true, isn't it? That's facts. I mean, look at mis- misinformation now, it's terrible. So I'm sure that they did think that these were, but you're not actually bothering to educate yourself. I mean, you mentioned it's a sin earlier, Will, and even in that they talk about patient zero, don't they? And saying that patient zero was, um, you know, and obviously we've done an episode on on patient zero. It wasn't patient zero at all. So it's it's all of these, it's all of it. It's a big ball of misinformation, isn't it? I think looking at the newspaper articles, this was one of the main sources of information. And I think you can just tell by the, just the tone and the language that this individual who's written in is just regurgitating everything that they've learned from the newspapers. Yeah. I think if we look at the government at the time, Margaret Thatcher was in power and she used to talk a lot about morality, especially around Section 28, which hadn't come in then, but was in the pipeline. And she, I would say, prided herself on family values and being what 
normal, if you like, within society. That's what she really pushed, wasn't it? Family. And anybody who didn't fit within those societal norms didn't have morals. Mm, And I was a kid at school that spent 13 years under Section 28 out of the 15 that it was it was in effect. And I Section 28 didn't affect me whatsoever and I moved to six different schools, but that's another subject. But when I looked into Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative Party, I think having these um, family values was a good thing. I don't think it was a bad thing, but I think as Jim was saying in one of his letters earlier, does that mean that you then lose compassion for other people? Surely you should be practising what you preach. Absolutely, because everybody is from a family, aren't they? Mm. And if you're promoting you know these values of virtue and integrity and compassion then it should really extend to somebody who is with a hiv or aids yeah. diagnosis why are we all of a sudden just vilifying these individuals absolutely no can not agree more but literally again i just have to say uh, we had a comment recently on uh, our social media about promiscuity and it's just like this all this reminds me of it's just echoing present day mm. yeah it is things haven't really changed have they oh that, that's no. depressing <laughs> right Jim Hoggart, yeah. who by now I've raised to national hero. Oh, I love it. I've nicknamed him Hoggers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he <Be> more, has... Hoggers. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm going to get a T-shirt printed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So he has, he has replied to name and address supplied. So the following week, on the 14th of October 1985, he writes a response. It says, Dear Rosalind... Loath though I am to pursue a ping pong exchange of correspondence through your columns, the further letter from name and address supplied raises points about AIDS which need further explanation. Jim highlights various routes of transmission of HIV, referred to then as HTLV3, that were deemed credible through theory and research before he concludes his letter with, once AIDS was recognised and identified, the word was spread. Don't give blood and avoid certain sex acts. But this takes time and all the while more people become infected. And here's the rub. It is attitudes displayed by name and address supplied, which hinders this process of education. Clouding issues and involving moral issues just makes the situation worse. There's nothing wrong with truth, virtue and morality. And it's a pity that some gay critics don't observe the first two values and apply some Christian compassion instead of the third. The media has a role to play in this, and so do the public. Stop pointing the finger and start helping us to help others. Oh, I love him so much. Go, Jim. Yes, go, Jim. (laughs) Oh, perfect reply. Absolutely faultless. Outstanding. Outstanding. Did the exchange continue, do we know? Obviously, I know we're not going to read it out. We're not going to spend, you know, the next week. Just it goes out on and, and on and on. But, oh, wow. Um, you know, hats off to Jim uh, with these robust responses. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I like I said earlier, I'm just left punching the air. Whether it had that same kind of effect back then, um, you know, perhaps with the gay community, that they've got somebody on their side fighting their corner, which let's remember, you know, Jim is part of the, the, the history of TVPS. It just... It's just, it's just so nice. It's, you know, it almost does kind of evoke in me anyway an emotion of um, obviously living with the condition. Just even today, all these years on, almost forty years on, that this, you know, there was people that were fighting, and obviously you guys still fighting today. Yeah, I think you're right. I hope, I hope Jim had lots of support. I'm sure he did. Because I think Are you guys not still in touch with Jim. No. Well, surprise, surprise, because I managed to track down Jim Hoggart. And he sent you guys a little message, so take a listen to this. Are you serious? Hi guys, uh, my name is Jim Hoggart, and I was one of the founder members of the Reading Area Age Support Group all the way back in 1985. Here to share with you today some echoes of those early days. Wow, what a long time ago it seems now, nearly 40 years, and how much the world has changed, and yet in many respects has remained the same. The need to campaign persuade and work in the community to support and educate others about AIDS and HIV infection is still vitally needed. And I'm still taken aback today when I hear of people experiencing discrimination due to their infection status. So where did we start? Well, it was a small group of volunteers, all fellas then, in a Berkshire town. No internet, no email, no mobile phones, and where Cut and paste meant exactly that, with scissors and glue and nocturnal visits to the office photocopier. But it starts also 
with a vision, a desire to understand a strange new disease, to help educate and give practical support to others and to protect ourselves, not just from a fatal and ghastly illness, but also from a growing backlash against not only those with HIV infection and AIDS, but the wave of prejudice against gay men in particular, a prejudice which showed itself not only verbally on the street and in writing in the media, but in access to services, employment, health care, benefits, housing, insurance. These were difficult times and they were getting worse. There were battles on multiple fronts. So this small group of volunteers start to map out a way forward, modelled on the excellent example set by the Terence Higgins Trust, amongst others. We had to learn quickly about AIDS itself, but also to train volunteers and promote the group, fundraise and build partnerships with others. All challenges that I know that you will recognise well, even 40 years later. And we had our strengths to draw on too. Although it was all men to start with, we were slowly becoming more gender diverse. And within a small group of about 10 to 12 people, we had a diversity of skills that we drew on. We had a psychologist who assisted with the training of counsellors, someone who was good at organising, a scientist who understood the wave of technical material that we had to wade through, and someone too in the group who possessed a superpower. He had no objection at all to going into a pub and waving a collection tin under people's noses and asking for donations. And I guess that fundraising is still as much of a challenge now as it was then. Those partnerships that we developed in those early days with the Terence Higgins Trust and with the Sexual Health Clinic in Reading, the Flora Unit, were critical as sources of support and membership of the group, but also in deepening our abilities and our credibility and in turn helping those partners. We developed a voice too as the go-to source for comment about AIDS and HIV infection in the local community around Reading. Critical in the days when the main source of local information was the local newspaper and radio station. We made sure that we spoke often and pushed back quite robustly, I think, now that I look back on the Evening Post correspondence. And we had each other too, supporting, encouraging and sharing of ideas, fears and quite a few laughs too along the way. Soon we had a helpline up and running, Thursday evenings only, mind, and we were training volunteers and buddying people with AIDS, HIV infection, and of course, the worried well, of which there were many. We persuaded Reading Council to take the issue of HIV infection seriously, with the help of our contacts within the council and the trusty Amstrad word processor. And it led to the appointment of one of the first AIDS officers outside of London and the Metropolitan Councils. The energy, enthusiasm and focus of the group led to positive progress. An example of what can be done when local people decide to take charge of their own destiny. And there was fun along the way too, some of it dark humour, such as a time that we attended the funeral of one of the people that we had been supporting with AIDS. And of course, the family had been told something quite different about his death. There we are, gathered outside the church for the funeral, Smoking, it was 1986 after all, and the mourners arrive and only then are we told that the deceased was supposed to have died from cancer and we're supposed to be members of a local cancer charity, quickly followed by the stubbing out of our dog ends. We agonise for hours over how to promote sexual health and in particular the use of condoms. It's difficult to believe now how little they were mentioned in public except as a joke before 1985 and I recall preparing for a sexual health workshop and agonising with another volunteer about which bananas to buy in Marks and Spencer to create the most authentic model for our practical demonstration of condom use. If you've ever seen the drama series It's a Sin then you'll know what those days were like. The best of times and the worst of times. But like now they were times when we can all make a real difference to the lives of others, despite the challenges that we face. I'm going to finish with a quote from an article I wrote a few years ago about those early days, and which I think fits quite well as a handoff. 
By 1987, the group was in good hands and would soon evolve into Thames Valley positive support and later other iterations. But the same principles hold strong now as they did then. Standing up for yourselves, helping others, campaigning for change, saving lives, education. They are all eternal drivers that help us to focus, strive and succeed. And sadly, they are still needed. To all the brave volunteers, the medical staff, the council staff and the councillors, thank you. To Terence Higgins Trust and all the other groups that we knew and worked alongside, thank you too. For all those who put their trust in us and who helped in whatever way, we remain eternally grateful. And for all of those who left us too soon, that we couldn't help and who we didn't see until it was too late, we will always remember you. But to a small town in Berkshire, we thank you most of all. That's all from the distant past. Keep up the good work and best wishes to you all for the future. You know what needs to be done. Oh, my God. Look, it's literally made me well up. Everything does, I know. But, oh, my <laughs> I'm God. I'm crying. How? Oh, I, I can't believe you spoke to him. Jim has got some amazing stories, and I think he has to be one of your guests on the podcast. Yeah, doesn't he? Definitely. Just... Definitely. Oh, it was just so fascinating to to hear the stories um, from somebody, you know, who was one of the founders of, of your charity today that actually lived through those times. Mm. Yeah, amazing, unbelievable. He, he sounds lovely, very calm, very in control, exactly who you would want to be leading an organisation like that during that time or even now. Do you know, I love that as a strap line, though, the, how we signed it off. You know what needs to be done. We do, Jim. Don't you worry. Poggers, we we've got it. <laughs> Please cut that out. <laughs> Please, if he comes on the podcast, he's going to be like, to stop calling me hoggers. <laughs> I was just thinking, actually, that's that's perfect. So, yeah, I have to stay in. <laughs> I'm getting a taste of my own medicine, Sarah. Where I'm like, edit that out. I know. Well, I found Fantastic. I just Googled him. Oh, look at him. Should we have a look at a picture? Ready? Can anyone see him? Yes. Oh. Yeah, that's what he looks like. Looks lovely. Wow. That's incredible. Loved it. Thank you so much for tracking yeah, him thank down. thank you. No, you're welcome. You know, it's all part of your history. In August 1985, Reading Area AIDS Support Group set up an AIDS helpline that is manned two hours a week every Thursday. Then in January 1986, with the slow appointment of a second AIDS counsellor for AIDS victims, the Reading Evening Post reported on the 16th of January 1986 under the headline Lifeline for AIDS Victims. And the article reads, The District Medical Officer from West Berkshire Health Authority has admitted the provision for AIDS sufferers is inadequate. Now... The support group, which is the Reading Area Aid Support Group. Now the support group has taken the matter into its own hands. And from March, it will be providing a comprehensive counselling service. This will be open to AIDS victims and people who have an antibody positive test. And by the 25th of March, 1986, Reading Area Aid Support Group was reported in the Reading Evening Post as cautiously backing an AIDS health campaign by the then Government Department for Health and Social Security. Then the following month in April 1986, Reading Area AIDS Support Group hit out at a Berkshire-based assurance company for asking gay men to take AIDS tests before being offered a mortgage. In the same month, the group praised Reading Borough Council for giving the group a grant for office supplies in the sum of £235. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, I know you're supposed to say, well, back then that would have been a lot of money, but I don't reckon it was. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, on the 16th of April, 1986, Jim Hoggart, who we've just heard from, told the, Reading Evening... <laughs> told the Reading Evening Post, we regard this grant as a real breakthrough and are pleased that they are taking the problem of AIDS and the work of this group seriously. And about time, no? Absolutely. So what are they? They're like a year, 18 months after the conception of the group mm, and they're so, only just yeah. being taken seriously with this grant for 250 uh, 235 pounds for pens and pencils yeah of all the things you think they would need i wouldn't have said office supplies was the most important but maybe it was jim's got a lot of letters to write guys back well, off. That's true. yeah envelopes and stamps yes, yes. <laughs> um in 1986, the Royal Barks Hospital VD unit gets the promised second AIDS counsellor. And by early 1987, Jim shares in the Reddit Evening Post that their hard work, support 
and reach to the Berkshire gay community is starting to pay off as gay men are taking up safer sex and taking less risks. During this time, Jim continued to challenge and inform readers of the Reading Evening Post by penning Dear Rosalind letters for her topical column. The Reading Area Aid Support Group was responsible for establishing a hardship fund and a buddy support service for individuals who were diagnosed with AIDS. Now, I just wanted to pick up with you two, because I'm sure I recall from one of your earlier um, episodes from the HIV podcast that you had a volunteer that was involved in the buddy and service. Is that right? Sean, our boss. <gasps> was it Sean? Mm. Really? Yeah, he started off with us as a buddy, didn't he? Way back in... Well, it would have been the mid-80s, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's been, yeah that's how he began. Mm. Speaking of which, we have a snippet of Sean, your boss, sharing what life was like as a TVPS buddy from your podcast, the HIV podcast episode, Sean, It's a Sin Special, which aired on the 13th of May 2021. Let's take a listen. With TVPS, they had a, a really robust buddy scheme and it was very much uh, go in and, and be there for that person. Often they were on their own, often living on their own or in a in hospital on their own. And you were just asked to go and visit and just be there as a listener or and to go and maybe help them with some, if they were at home, go and do some shopping for them. Don't remember them getting much social care. Uh, so that we would do, I would do shopping, um, that I would you know, just take them out, you know, walk them out um, in their wheelchair or whatever. I mean, they were all at different stages. I mean, I looked after about two or three for a very short period of time. Uh, one was a real char- a local character. He, he was disabled as well, but you would never realise it. He managed to get around from in his wheelchair. You'd have to sort of, um, you know, go and see him and he'd be, and I'd sort of, because uh, there was no mobiles in those days, you know, where is he? And you'd, you'd, you'd know he'd be sort of walking around, going around in the wheelchair and, in, and you'd have to go and find him in Slough High Street. Uh, <laughs> he was quite a character. You know, he, it was very short term support for him because he was quite poorly and used to go and see him and then go and see him in hospital. I don't think I think I might be one of the few people that went actually visited him in hospital. And I think he didn't get any visitors. He didn't really have any family and such. So that was very much the early days. On, and that sort of there was a buddy self health group, which was great because it was quite hard work to take uh-huh. all that stuff on. There were boundaries as well because some some buddies did get too close to some of the clients because they ended up being not 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 in a sexual way, but very you know friendly. And it, it, there was a line, you know, it was difficult sometimes to know where's the line uh, because they could call you any time of the day, and it was you know it could be quite challenging sometimes for some of the, the buddies to have that distance from the from the client as well because you do most of the people wanted to help and be there for them but it was it could take over they could take over particularly if they were really vulnerable and on their own you know and so be so a lot of it was all about supporting the buddy group was about supporting each other and helping people and then what happened next was in the late 1980s reading area aid support group launched reading body positive which consisted of two volunteers and four clients living with hiv The name was later changed to Thames Valley Body Positive, which leads us on to an article in the Reading Evening Post on the 6th of August 1990. So the headline of the article is My AIDS Agony and the strap line says Brave Victim Speaks Out in Bid to Save Others from Same Fate. Sarah, who lives in Berkshire, is your typical girl next door. She's fun to be with, popular amongst her friends, well-educated and from a good background. Sarah doesn't inject drugs and never has. She's heterosexual and, like many 25-year-olds, has had a few boyfriends. But she's not been promiscuous and lived with her last boyfriend for some time. That was before her world fell apart last October. For it was last autumn that Sarah, an assumed name to protect her identity, discovered she was HIV positive. Now, for the first time, she's broken her silence to talk to the Post in a desperate bid to save others from the same fate. Oh, good on Sarah. Oh, brave Sarah. Gosh, can you imagine doing that? Mm. They've gone to quite a, quite extremes, haven't they, to make sure that we all know that she's definitely not promiscuous. That's what I was just about to say, actually. The opening sentence is just... Again, setting us up for the fact that she's a typical girl next door. She's fun to be with. She's popular amongst her friends. She's well educated. She's from a good background. So it yeah. should be a shocker to all the all those that are reading it that she's got HIV/AIDS. And again, it's just feeding into 
what what kind of person gets this disease well don't you think it's funny how the two differing um like news stories so when it's about of the time when it's about anyone that's gay it's all of this horrendous language and it's you know they deserve it in quotes but then when it's somebody like this the whole article is is designed to show her as a victim she did not deserve this i feel like it doesn't really give me that sense of they're obviously wanting to say look this could happen to anyone but i feel like it doesn't particularly come across like that it just tells us poor poor sarah who didn't deserve this unlike all the other people that definitely do mm. that's how this feels it's just weird well, it's just very judgmental, isn't it? You know, that get, it was called gay plague, wasn't it? So therefore, anyone who's gay would be associated mm. with it. And I can see what they're trying to do. They're trying to kind of show that HIV affects everybody. But the, the tone of the article, yes, comes across as uh, this is not in any way Sarah's fault that she's contracted this. Mm, um, it almost sounds like the journalists themselves is trying to convince themselves <laughs> that heterosexual people can, can contract HIV in it as, as well. <laughs> Yeah, very true. I mean, the article, um, to kind of summarise what it says, Sarah had sought medical attention with gastric issues and weight loss uh, and was subsequently diagnosed HIV positive. She believes she was infected eight years prior, so around 1982, by her ex-boyfriend. Her boyfriend from her current long-term relationship tested negative, but her diagnosis caused them to split up. She only informed her mum and a close friend. She's very sad that she won't have children. She's seeing her friends getting married and having children of their own. uh, And she can't see herself meeting a new man. She thinks she'll be single and lonely. She doesn't know how she will feel if it turns into full-blown AIDS. Article uh, finishes by saying Sarah, who looks a picture of health, has tried to continue living normally as far as possible. She's still working and says that a self-help group for HIV positive people operating in the area has been a lifeline. Because of the stigma still attached to AIDS, the group called the Thames Valley Body Positive dares not reveal where it meets each week or how many members it has. It provides a chance for members to discuss their emotions in a totally confidential atmosphere, offer each other support and try out alternative health therapies. So it just goes back to what you were saying earlier about having to meet in secrecy and that's still going on in this period of, ta- period of time. But isn't it amazing that, again, that you guys were there for for individuals like Sarah? Yeah. I mean, I'm, ha- I'm glad she had somewhere to go, people to talk to, a safe place where she can really express her feelings. I mean, the article, it's intrusive, isn't it? You know, they're... They're asking her Mm. how she contracted it. Who do you think you got this from? How Mm. are you going to feel if you get AIDS? Do you think you're going to have a normal life? All of those things must have been so difficult for her to answer. And this might be a little bit of a stupid question, but um, is this kind of still a service that you offer to to your service users today? They they meet up and hook up and, you know, be amongst other people living with, with HIV. Yeah. So important. Peer Mm. support, whether it's formal peer support where you're pairing two people together or whether it's group peer support where you're holding a drop in and anybody can come in is vital, I would say, because for some of our service users, it's still the only place that they can truly be themselves. Sad though it is, we have at least, I would say, 80 percent of our service users who are not open about their diagnosis uh, and to their friends, to their family. So really, our centre is the one place where they can talk about it if they want to Mm. be themselves and they won't be judged and they won't be stigmatized which is what they fear from society is it just kind of um everyday aspects of life yeah 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 and i think there's a huge degree or huge value in being able to meet other people living with hiv because it reinforces the view that you know you can do this you know, there are lots of you doing this all over the county. You're all, you're working, you're having children, you've got relationships. So it's great to be able to demonstrate that to someone who's perhaps newly diagnosed and is like, well, this is it, my love's going to end. It's like, mm. no, no, come come to our drop-in and meet all of these people and see how happy and successful they are. And actually, at the drop-in, HIV is not really discussed that right. much. I think a lot of people think it's, you know, you all sit down in a circle and how are we feeling this week? No. They're more chatty, Will, than me yeah. and Jess are. And I think the beauty noisy. is that we're saying people can just be themselves. And that's the point, isn't it? They're not having to worry about what they're saying. Because even if they are talking about their week and perhaps they went to the clinic or whatever, around other people, they might be having to check what they're saying. That constant internal mm. filter that you have, 
They don't have to do that at our place. Then just be, oh yeah, you know, popped to clinic, saw mags, you know, did this, did you know? It's we're it. It basically allows people to just, like Sarah said, just be themselves, just relax. There's none of that all on guard constantly. Yeah. And there's a lot of compassion at the drop in. There's a lot of understanding and a lot of unspoken understanding. I would say between our service users and. Mm actually really lovely to see you know the nosy part of me going back to that article is wondering what happened next to sarah i mean i have to admit the timeline worries me slightly and i know as professionals um neither of you would break client confidentiality but do you know anything about this assumed sarah or what happened to her next i don't do you know i'm laughing laughing because it's the first question that me and jess have just looked at each other like ah no i don't know either I um, imagine you won't keep a record. of. We know. don't keep records that far back. You're absolutely right. Also, it's a pseudo name. So even if we did still support Sarah, we might not know that that's Sarah. Does that make sense? Mm. Because obviously staff change, time moves on. But really, if there is somebody who recognises this article and recognises them, you know, having a pseudonym of Sarah, then perhaps maybe she could drop us a line if she, if she felt that she yes. could to let us know what happened next. Yeah. Still in the early 90s, on the 14th of September 1990, the Books Examiner newspaper reports several HIV AIDS groups have come together to man a new HIV AIDS helpline called Thames Valley AIDS Network. The article states, it brings together organisations from throughout the area to provide comprehensive telephone helpline, offering confidential help and advice to HIV sufferers and their families. And it's interesting, really, that there's so many telephone lines being set up here. I know. I mean, the yeah, farm bill must have it? been through the roof. <laughs> it's weird now, though, isn't it? To think back then, that was really, your, that was instant access, wasn't it, to support, mm. picking up the phone, which must have been such a brave thing to do. I mean, now we're all texting and WhatsApping and definitely don't want to speak to anyone yeah. personally. But gosh, back then. But Jim as well, Hoggers, um, was telling me as well about the telephone because I was sat thinking great you know there's a telephone line but he actually highlighted to me that he recalls from experience that a lot of times these people that would ring into the telephone helpline did it in secrecy within their own homes or calls would often be very hurried very oh. hushed because there was people in the house when they were making these calls and he highlighted to me that he recalls at the time that there wasn't such a thing as itemized telephone bills so they wouldn't see the number but calls were very were done you know in secrecy and, and very quick and also in the mm. telephone box you've got the matter of pumping the phone with loose change mm. you know if you oh run out of change gosh. the call has to end so i think it's really i think it brought drop with you know hearing from jim it really brings it into perspective that today we take for granted picking up the telephone and being able to speak to people but mm. back then whole different story gosh i wonder how people i mean the whole process of promoting that service would have been very different as well wouldn't it you're you're mm. having to go and find a flyer in a pub i guess or, mm. or 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 a leaflet there's no social media is there there's no so if you were affected and you wanted support you really had to look for where you could get that support and uh, uh, tvps come up quite often in the newspaper art- archives because um, there's hits with your names in regards to advertisements that are placed there as a telephone line service or they'll come up in a directory of services that are offered and, you know, you're in there generally at the top as well because it fell under AIDS. Oh, is that how they'd classify it back then? Yeah, a classified ad, that's it, yeah. Right, okay, so they we would be at the top because it's AIDS. Yeah, it'd come under A for AIDS. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. So back to your history. As the 90s roll on, Thames Valley Body Positive sets up its first educational training sessions for local statutory and voluntary agencies with a focus on what life is like living with HIV. They also set up a hardship fund and move to what is now known as the Burnham Centre. So what, what is the purpose of a hardship fund? So that would have been to help people who were struggling financially right. uh, and they could apply to the fund uh, for help with bills or for help with food. It's like it kind of predates a food bank voucher, if you like. Right. Um, and a lot of people living with HIV or living with AIDS at the time couldn't work or were told to stop working. And although they'd be living on on some form of benefit, it's obviously not going to be as, as much as their income would have been from working. So people did suffer hardship. And the other thing is that, of course, people were very secretive about the diagnosis. So if you, you wanted support, there were very few agencies people would go to to access support. It really was just us. So I think we felt as an organisation a really strong moral obligation to make sure that everybody we supported had food on the table and a roof over their head 
wow. um, and as a comfortable kind of existence as they could have. Wow. And from this period of the 90s is a voice that both of you may or should recognise. This is Sean. I'm the chair of TVPS. I've been involved for just over 30 years. I'm absolutely proud to be working with Sarah and Jess and the team, Chantal, Sue and Zoe. They do an amazing job and have done for many, many years. Worked with Sarah over 20 years and Jess over 15 years. And they've always managed to make sure that the, as the needs of our clients change, they adapt the support needs that we give them. I've been involved for a long time, over 30 years, as I said. And um, from the start, back in the early 90s, it was very much short-term support for helping people who didn't have long to live, sadly, but to now supporting people who live relatively full lives and normal life as much as they can, which is amazing. The aim of TPPS hasn't changed in all those years. We're very client supporting. We are really proud to be around nearly 40 years, which we other charities can't say. And that's because the stewardship that Sarah and Jess and the team give behind the scenes to make sure that we're funded, to make sure we're relevant, to make sure we have good connections with the people that we need to connect with is tremendous. Whoa, high praise indeed. <gasps> oh, you got Sean on here. I love it. Sean, I spoke to him yesterday. He didn't mention anything about this. I love this. This is so fun, <laughs> all these surprise guests. I mean, to be give Sean credit, he's been involved in the organisation longer than both of us, yep. and he's our boss. So he's steering this ship, keeping me and Jess on on course, because I think we're both very open about the fact it can be a bit chaotic sometimes. So full credit to yep. him for making TVPS what it is today. Uh, yeah, and giving us his time. You know, he yeah. volunteers as our chair and has done for many, many years. And he, we have to say, obviously, we always mention Sean and we joke about him, but he honestly, he is a really great boss and he is a really, really great chair. And it's testament to the fact that you guys have all been involved so long, helping the people of not just Reading, but you cover the whole of Berkshire, Berkshire, mm. yeah? Yeah, yeah, we do. I know it sounds a bit like a cult, doesn't it? Once you join, you can't leave. It's not like that at all. It's just a really lovely place. Help me, place Will. Help go. me. Help me. I'm <laughs> blinking twice. Please. I'm in Sarah's basement. I'm sending an Uber. <laughs> it's just a really nice place to work, isn't it, Jess? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say, it's probably a bit of a, a silly question, really, but are you still, you still must be motivated today as you were from when you first started even though you know some aspects of the um the virus and the community have changed yeah yeah absolutely there was so much work to be done and you know we're in an area of the country where prevalence of HIV is increasing um Mm. contrary to what's happening in the rest of the UK Uh, and there's a lot of work to be done to address to address that and we're doing all of this against the background of funding cuts I know other charities are experiencing that too, but it doesn't make the job any easier. But I think both Jess and I really thrive on that sort of challenge. Absolutely. And we're extremely lucky in the fact of where we work. And obviously with Sean or Sarah and the rest of the team, they're amazing. But our board of trustees trust us in terms of um, we're quite progressive, I would say. Um, I would say we're actually very innovative as well. And I feel like sometimes some of the... um, initiatives that we are pushing forward when we're speaking to other people it's like oh crikey that's a bit you know that's a bit forward thinking that's a bit much but our board of trustees trust us say yeah try it try this out try that out let's see what works in terms of looking at what we are seeing on the ground with our own service users so we can adapt really rapidly and a lot of a lot of other organizations couldn't possibly adapt that quickly because if you're a big organization you know there have to be lots of meetings and lots of policies and lots of red tape to go through whereas our board understands that what we are doing is for the community is for our service users and so they'll be like yeah cool okay great yep go and try that thing let's see let's see if it works sort of how the podcast happens you know and just to pick up when you were saying about funding cuts, like, um, you know, obviously we know how the economy has been for the last couple of years. And what does funding cuts mean for you as a charity? You know, what, how does that affect uh, you as the charity and the service users? It's really tricky because we're experiencing funding cuts on one hand. So we've got less money to support mm. the people um, across Berkshire. And yet we're experiencing an increase in demand. Mm. So you don't have to be a math genius to to work out that if you've got less money and more people, something has to has to give, really. You just can't do it all. I think we're quite good at sourcing funding from other places. So we don't rely solely on statutory funding and we haven't been able to for a few years now. 
but it's a competitive market and we are up against a lot of other good charities also bidding for money from funding pots. Um, but it's not easy, not by any stretch of the imagination. We are always looking for ways to cut the budget and yet we're the busiest we've ever been. I mean, don't get me started on this soapbox wheel because I will rant for hours because I just <laughs> think, you know, the government is saying that we need to uh, meet the target of uh, zero transmissions of HIV by 2030. Mm. And if they really, really are serious, then they need to be supporting the whole of the HIV sector much more effectively. Especially as you guys have got such a long history and going back to your history as the AIDS pandemic rumbles on and the support and needs of those affected continues, members of Thames Valley AIDS Network merged in 1994 to create Thames Valley Positive Support. You guys, you know, as you exist today, TVPS. And becoming the first body positive and AIDS service provider in the UK. Uh, one of the early newspaper archives that makes reference to TVPS is on the 24th of March, 1994, in the Bracknell and Ascot Times, where Richard Hill, the TVPS publicity officer, thanked the generosity of cinema goers attending the film Philadelphia on the 4th of March, 1994, and where the rattle of charity buckets raised £247.35. Good effort. And while there are many articles covering the dedicated fundraising work and events throughout the 90s um, in regards to TVPS, it was a two-page spread for World AIDS Day 1995 that caught my eye. Across the two pages are interviews with the team behind TVPS and an interview with a TVPS client under the headline, Fear of Ignorance Makes Michael Live in Silence. And the article reads, Michael McDonald, again, not his real name, found out he was HIV positive more than five years ago. He said, I didn't say anything for about five minutes. I think the first thing I said was, at least one day I'll get to be the way I've always wanted to be. Oh, oh. <laughs> a dark humour. But, you know, ironically, I mentioned this in, in my book, and it was my experience that when I was diagnosed, you know, it's probably wrong. Some people probably would, you know, wouldn't appreciate it. But my just initial response was, I'm way too fat to have AIDS. Oh, um, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and the nurse, the nurse bit his lip and just, you know, to, to give me give me that kind of naughty look, you know, and went, oh, well. But yeah, it was just my response and, you know, in the, the way of dealing with what, you know, he'd just broken to me. Um, but now Michael is a healthy looking, vibrant 34 year old with the same humorous outlook on life. Michael, who lives in Reading and works full time, admits it has not been easy. He has lived through a partner dying of AIDS and one of the two men he was a buddy to be a friend and confidant has also died. Michael shares he has remained tight-lipped about his HIV status, even with his current partner, as they have a safe sex relationship. But Michael does state, but there is a lot of support from people at TVPS that I have told. So again, mm. it's back to you guys. Yeah. And oh, again, those buddies, they were so important, weren't they, back mm. then? They could have been the only person that you kind of um, spoke to about your diagnosis. Um, and to have that support, to have someone come into your house or going shopping with you or or just kind of being there for you at the end of a phone was kind of crucial, wasn't it? It was so isolating. It's isolating now for, for a lot of people. But back then, my goodness, it really was isolating. And it's really quite sad as well to think that while Michael's doing a good deed in being a buddy, you know, he's diagnosed himself and is living with it and it's almost you're seeing perhaps your own life play out you know in somebody else's diagnosis who you know, as the article shares eventually just passes away yeah there's a lot we've talked about it in um, episodes that we've done before about how at that time a lot of gay men were just waiting to contract it kind of being very grateful that they they hadn't got it but seeing lots of their friends have it i remember one of our trustees another kind of founder of our group David Solly talked to me about this a few, a, a few years ago and he said you know you go out to a nightclub on a Friday or a Saturday night and you do a quick scan of the room to see who was there and those that were missing you knew were probably in hospital with AIDS. Wow sad isn't it? Yeah I think there's a lot of guilt amongst long-term survivors of HIV mm who would have contracted in the 80s, why did they live and their friends, partners didn't? And psychologically, mm. they were celebrating that this is the first group to move into old age with HIV, and that is fantastic. Yeah. They carry a lot of that baggage mm. about why me 
In the noughties, TVPS put its focus on post-HIV diagnosis support when an increase in clients became dependent on such vital services and support. Funding was secured from the National Lottery, where a new drop-in centre opens in Reading to complement the one in Slough, along with a fresh recruitment drive to expand the existing team of support workers and volunteers. Given the demand for support and services, TVPS had to move to larger premises in Reading and found a need to extend its opening hours to better serve its clients. In the 2010s, TVPS secured two substantial sources of funding from children in need to recruit a youth worker and comic relief to recruit an older person worker. In 2013, TVPS is awarded the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, along with the Pride of Reading Award. What more can you tell us about the Queen Award? I know you've mentioned it quite a few times on your um, on the HIV podcast in several episodes, but what actually is the Queen's Award? So the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, it, it's like the MBE for voluntary groups. Obviously, I think it's now Ooh. called the King's Award, but obviously we we had it when, you know, Lizzie was alive. So yeah, basic, yeah it's, it's basically that. It's um, an, an award that recognises all of the work that your volunteers have put in all of that change that they've made and it really really celebrates all of our volunteers so it's not really about sort of tvps it's about tvps's volunteers and how much they've done through support work through volunteering through buddying through you know jim hoggett's letters and look you know (laughs) all of that it celebrates everything so we were unbelievably proud to get that oh amazing but can i just tell you about the uh pride of reading awards yeah (laughs) About Sarah bear hugging Chris Tarrant, (laughs) flinging herself at him. Do you know what though? I really felt for her because obviously we didn't know that we were were invited there because we'd won it. So it was genuinely a real surprise, and we were genuinely so happy. And he did sort of put his arm out. You know when someone does that and puts their arm out, but he Uh. was sort of doing it to beckon her to take a picture. And she just really misread the situation and just went straight in for a big old hug. It was. (laughs) I mean, I was still stuck in a chair at the back of the room. Couldn't get through. Excuse me. Excuse me. Couldn't get there. Um, yeah, it was it was quite hideous, but Eventful. amazing. We were very proud again. <laughs> but there is a lovely picture on um, the internet. Actually, this article is on the on the internet. There's a lovely picture of you all with with Chris Tarrant. Yeah. Oh, there is. God. <laughs> I'm going to have to dig that out. Yeah. In my defence, I was very excited. I'd not long had, uh, I don't know which one of my sons, but one of them, say, I was just excited to be out of the house, mixing with adults. <laughs> and I think I let my excitement get away with me. Mm. <laughs> And TVPS went on to introduce free HIV testing in 2014. And the following year, TVPS is shortlisted in the National Sexual Health Charity Award 2015. Sarah McAdam, TVPS CEO, was shortlisted in the Sue Ryder Women of Achievement Award in 2016. And just to break away slightly, what can you tell us about the nomination? Well, again, I just had a baby. There seems to be a common theme, doesn't there, with awards and babies? <laughs> well, if you want that um, that, that OBE, then I think maybe... <laughs> Beggar cracking on the bird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. oh, do you know what? It was a huge, huge honour. It was fantastic to meet so many other inspirational women. Um, and I was just glad to be there, really, to be included with that group. I mean, what an accolade. Wow. And I'm down to... did you win it? No. Oh. No, she's not inspirational enough. But I got a lovely lunch. Rob, <laughs> Jess was there too because I can't go to anything on my own. So Jess was Sorry, there. Rob, but we got well fed behind me. <laughs> yeah. I nominated you, didn't I? I think that's I why know. I Let's was not there. ruin it. Let's pretend a member of the public nominated okay. me. Okay, it was an yeah, anonymous, yeah. No, anon. What? <laughs> oh. And we got to the awards, and they were like, "No, not inspirational enough, are you?" <laughs> I know. I'm only joking. But isn't that harsh, that awards? It's like, don't let everyone go and then be like, you were almost inspirational enough, but not quite. I think with adults and awards ceremonies, it should be very much like children's past the parcel. Everybody's a winner. I agree. Oh, God, absolutely. (laughs) That's what we're going to be like at the Arias. I feel like don't don't nominate us if there's not something, you know, come on, don't get my hopes up. Oh, God. Do you know what I'm going to have to do, Will, is I'm going to have to secretly make up a little party bag for her (gasps) as a consolation prize. (laughs) Oh my god! I'm going to get those. You know those crappy medals you can get from supermarkets. Sarah, <laughs> we're wearing those home. 
<laughs> so just to break away, this is not in the script, but the Arias, how excited are you? So excited. Well, I think Jess is, is super excited and I'm pretty mellow. on social media, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, do you know what they will? Like, I will keep saying this because I cannot believe it. I keep getting told, oh my God, on the weekend, I was listening to the radio, Radio 6 was on. I don't know, I was pottering about. And even on BBC Radio 6, on the radio show, this woman, I don't know who she was, but she was like, oh, guys, this show has been nominated like um, for the Oscars of radio and audio, the Arias. Ooh. And I was just like, how are we also nominated? <sighs> so, yeah, I'm that excited. How did, how did you find out? But through, I, was watching, <laughs> I was watching the live feed sat in my bed. On, on like YouTube, you could watch a live feed because I didn't think, you know, we, you know, it's such a huge awards. It was one of those uh-huh. scenes where you're like, you know, we've entered and fingers crossed. But uh-huh. and I hadn't mentioned it to Sarah or anything that there was um, that that was happening at the time. Um, so she actually must have been like, what, why is Jess bombarding me with texts in the evening? <gasps> no, thank you. Sphere you know where I was? I haven't told you this. I was in the bath. Oh. <laughs> and I saw my phone flash and I was like, oh, it's Jess. I can't not kind of maybe this isn't like an emergency but I felt very uncomfortable oh I'm sorry well now I do too because now I know that you read it and you were naked I was naked oh, good yes. <laughs> save for my flannel Ooh. my modesty flannel oh, oh. You're gonna say something, <laughs> something else, else? <laughs> cavernous flannel <laughs> But yeah, so I was just watching the live feed and obviously the category came up and I hadn't realised they were doing it in alphabetical order, which I wish I had because I was instantly like, oh, clearly we're not getting it. And then second, we were second from last. And out of nowhere, it was just like the HV podcast. I started shouting at Ben, my partner, who literally went, what are the Arias? And I was like, oh, fuck off. Like, you're no help here. (laughs) Don't talk to me. So I was on the phone. I was texting so fast to Sarah. And I was just like, I, I can't believe it. I cannot believe we've been nominated. Like, so to be fair, I joke that I want something, but actually just to be nominated is unreal. Like we couldn't get to a higher award. So wow. it's, yeah, unbelievable. So when's the, when's the ceremony? 7th of May at Theatre oh, Royal it? Drury Lane. Yes. Sir. Oh, I'm going to write that. going to note that down. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Please do. Please do. I'd like it if you came. Well, <laughs> please right. do come along. Blimey. Oh, it's the I've... day after a bank holiday. I know. I know. I think I was more. That's such an old person thing to say, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Actually, but right. yeah, it's yeah, unbelievable. Well, fingers crossed, guys. Fingers crossed. Legs crossed. Everything. Sausage fingers and toes crossed. Yeah. It's Romish friend Nathan that's hosting it. You can only imagine <gasps> what I'll do to him if we win. That oh. sounds like a threat, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> sounds like an arrestable offence. Yeah. Now yeah, let's move on. <laughs> so we've looked back at a very brief history of TVPS. It's the touch of the iceberg. And we've tried to manoeuvre through the newspaper archives. And there was just endless print on you guys doing the fantastic work that you're still doing today. So really, just to kind of summarise and wrap up, can you tell us, you know, what TVPS is doing today and perhaps what it's got planned for the future. I know you've got the HIV podcast. We've just been talking about the the areas. Yeah, so with the HIV podcast and the dedicated team you've got behind you today, you've got Sue, Zoe, Chantel. We have got, I mean, we've got a fantastic team, an, an amazing board of um, trustees, really loyal, committed volunteers, all of that infrastructure mm. stands us in good stead for the future. Demand for the service has never been so high. And we really just want to carry on doing what we've been doing for the last 40 years, making sure that anyone affected by HIV in Berkshire or North Hampshire can access support from us. They're not going to feel judged, can help lessen the stigma, and they can bring their kind of skills and their kind of expertise to our organisation. I think that's sometimes when people access a charity, it can feel almost like a failure you know I'm not able to cope Mm. with kind of life on my own so I need support we don't look at our service users in that way I don't think I've ever met anyone in my entire 20 years who doesn't have skills and expertise that are useful to us in some way I know it makes it sound like I'm exploiting them I'm not (laughs) but a lot of the work we do is around building self-esteem and confidence because the diagnosis has set them back and what all of our service users kind of bring to our organisation, creating that family feel and that sense of belonging is really kind of important. And I really want to ensure we continue doing that going forward. I want to ask, actually, the threat of the loss of the premises, where are you at with that? 
Oh, so we're no further forward, really. So our premises are owned by Slough Council and Slough Council is bankrupt and they've been told to sell all their assets, which includes our premises. Uh, So far, we have escaped any sales. They've been selling other uh, community properties. Uh, And moving forward, we don't know what our future holds, but without a premises to operate out of, we cannot offer our services. Uh, Slough has the um, one of the highest prevalences of HIV in in Mm. the region, in the southeast region. So you would hope that the council would recognise that this is an essential service and that we need premises to operate out of. And we don't we pay them rent. We're not. And we maintain the building. So this isn't something they've given us as a kind of gifting kind or anything like that. But we're in limbo. I hope I hope the council will reconsider selling our asset so that we can continue to support their community. Yeah. Um, with opt out testing that's going to be happening in A&E's on the way, you know, there is going to be another surge in demand beyond what we already have. So You just think it would be absolutely madness to sort of make us homeless at this point. So all that's left for me to do is to say a massive thank you to Thames Valley Positive Support and everybody behind the scenes at TVPS for allowing me the opportunity to have a rummage around in the newspaper archives to bring you this very brief history of your charity. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much for sharing our history. I love it. Yeah, it's no, been amazing. Thank you so and thank you for all of the effort you put into finding Jim and also talking to Sean. And a massive thank you to Sean, Sarah, Jess and everybody behind the scenes for all the emails and keeping this a secret and for allowing me to sneak into the TVPS HQ where they produce the HIV podcast. And an absolute massive thank you to a legend, Jim Hoggart, hashtag be more Jim. And if you'd like to find out more about Thames Valley Positive Support and the work they do, you can visit their website at tvps.org.uk and you can look them up on Instagram at TVPS Charity. And if you'd like to listen to the weekly podcast that TVPS produce called The HIV Podcast, then you can search The HIV Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can also look them up on Instagram and follow them at The HIV Podcast. All of the actual newspaper articles mentioned in this serving are available on the Extra Tea blog. You can find the link below in the show notes. If you've enjoyed listening to Two Bitter Old Queens, then don't be a shady bitch and show us some love with... A big fat like. A comment. A share. As in the link, not as in... Do you believe in life after love? Oh. And for fuck's sake, don't forget to... Subscribe and follow. Uh, yes anyway shall we start oh yeah sorry all right i'm gonna start it again gonna start it again jess ready okay. welcome to the hiv podcast oh, i don't like the word hogging <laughs> why don't interfere with my sphere of intimacy <laughs> i forgot about the sphere of intimacy is it my go <laughs> right i can leave all of this in <laughs> hang on, let me try to be a bit more excited Oh, because I'm struggling. <laughs> <laughs> body support, a body positive. I just can't get my tongue around it. Where's Madam gone? She's gone for a wee. No, she's here. Where? <laughs> you just can't see her unless she's speaking. So say something, Sarah. Hello. Oh, look at us okay. taking over, Sarah. I know. Good. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> as far as hanging out. Oh, sorry. And along with the rest of sophistry. How do I say that? Sophistry. (laughs) Right, I'm going to carry on. Oh, where did I get to? Where did you hear? You were like this, if that's any help. (laughs) (laughs) Um. Help group for HIV positive people. Sorry. Got a thing for the old gingers. Is he ginger? He's blonde. It's ginger. He's blonde. You're thinking of Chris Evans. (laughs) Public okay, it was an anonymous <laughs> no, anonymous. Uh, what? <laughs> oh, look at the face on Jess. It's like she's sucking a lemon. What's up with you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm done now. I'm going for a lie down. <laughs>